friends father frank buffone here national director of priests for life glad to be with you this morning and uh, uh thank you for taking the time to uh, to join me for a few moments when i'm going to continue to reflect with you about the movie unplanned which is coming out in the theaters on march the 29th and is very very instructive about the whole issue of abortion the pro-life movement and the wounds that abortion causes and what we need to do to end it we uh, will start, though, with a uh, reflection from my book, Pro-Life Reflections for Every Day. In Matthew 16, 24, we read, Anyone who wishes to follow me must deny himself. Reflection. The traditional practice of giving something up for Lent is a practice of self-denial. It means we say no to ourselves and yes to God and others. This reverses the pattern of sin, particularly abortion, which says yes to ourselves and no to God and others. Let us pray. Lord, as I practice self-denial, I offer my sacrifices for children. May we say yes to you and yes to the unborn. Amen. So if you want your copy of this book, go to ProLifeReflectionsForEveryDay.com. The movie Unplanned is a story of the conversion of former Planned Parenthood Clinic director Abby Johnson, whom I have known for a very long time. Uh, she knew uh, me and, in fact, was watching my programs on abortion when she was still working in the abortion facility. I prayed outside her facility uh, at one point, and she recognized me out the window, wanted to come out and greet me, but her colleague said, no, you shouldn't do that. But shortly after she came out of the industry, she came to me. Uh, I helped her on the journey of healing. Uh, in fact, we did some work together in helping to heal other people who were coming out of the abortion industry as a result of her book, Unplanned, to which I wrote the foreword. And um, I also, uh, on a personal level, am the uh, uh, godfather to her second child. So. Abby and Doug uh, and their family uh, are, um, are also part of uh, my circle of friends. And now this movie is coming out, and it's based on the book. And as we described in the previous uh, program when I talked about this movie, and if you didn't see that program, you can find it on my Facebook page or at endabortion.tv. Uh, I talked about how it was that she was shaken out of the denial and the lies that abortion practitioners find themselves in. She actually saw what happens in an abortion on the ultrasound and um, saw the aborted babies also in the, uh, in the room where uh, the bodies in the abortion facility are kept. And this is characteristic of the journey of a lot of people who work in the abortion industry. One of the facets of my ministry since 1993 has been to assist people who are coming out of the abortion facility. Our executive director, Janet Morana, is also uh, specially trained in the dynamics of this. Dr. Philip Ney, Canadian psychiatrist, has done a lot of work, has done pioneering work 
in understanding the mindset of those who work in the abortion industry. And by understanding the mindset of those who work there, you can understand the key to helping them leave and to find healing once they do uh, leave the abortion industry. Um, in fact, Dr. Ney wrote this book. We talked about it in the previous segment. It's the Centurion's Pathway. Centurions refer to those who, like Abby, have left the abortion facility. Uh, and the Centurions also is a specific healing program that Dr. Ney has developed, that Janet and I and, and some others are trained in, uh, and that are helping people all around the world uh, to come out of the abortion facility. Dr. Ney also wrote this book, called Deeply Damaged, and that is a good description of these abortion facility workers uh, and also of the moms, the dads, the grandparents, the siblings, the family members of aborted babies. They are deeply damaged, and uh, this book goes into that at great length. It's, a, it's an excellent book to really study if you want to appreciate the kinds of uh, wounds and the kinds of damage that abortion does. Well, I want to talk about some of those perspectives here when you look at this uh, movie, which I hope you will see as quickly as you can once it comes out on March 29th. You see various dimensions of the wounds of abortion. Now, we talked about it from the perspective of the abortion practitioners in the last program. On this one, I want to talk to you about it from the perspective of some of the other people involved. Take, for example, first of all, of course, the mom. Every mom who aborts her child is deeply damaged. Not some of the time, but all of the time. And Abby herself, not only did she work uh, helping to provide abortions, but she herself had two abortions, as this movie makes clear. And also, you see in the movie uh, the scene a very disturbing scene of the results of her chemical abortion. Uh, what happens here, brothers and sisters, and it is not at all done for the good of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the mom who's having the procedure. It's done for the selfish reason uh, of the good of the abortionist, who, as we saw in the last episode, are very affected by seeing the baby body parts. You, you see that also coming across in this film. At a certain point, Abby is brought into the room, uh, uh, which is called the, pro the POC room, Products of Conception. And you actually see one of the aborted babies, and, and uh, she takes the arm of that baby and lifts it up. And by the way, her supervisor there at that point says, I know you're the right one for the job to take over this clinic because you're the only one who's come in here and seen this and, and didn't cry. And you see that ties in with what I was saying in the previous program, and it's part of the deep damage that these abortion practitioners so dehumanize themselves that they're no longer in touch with their own, uh, their own emotions. But going back to, to the mom, so the scene in this movie about the chemical abortion shows the kind of damage that is done to those who do this technique. It's a drug technique, and uh, you go to the abortion facility, you take the first drug, and then you take the second one uh, a day or two later at home to finish the process of the, uh, having your body expel the child. Now, what that does, the convenience for the abortionist is that he or she and his or her staff don't have to deal with the bloody body parts of the aborted baby. The problem for the mom, of course, is that now she becomes the abortionist, her home becomes the abortion clinic, and she has to deal with the bloody baby parts. And you see a scene in this movie where those bloody baby parts come out of her in the shower, and she has to pick them up and throw them into the toilet. It is a very dramatic, disturbing scene that reminds us that chemical abortion is not just as easy as taking a pill. It's not. That's a lie of the abortion industry. And one of the things that comes across multiple times in the movie Unfilmed unplanned rather, is uh, how the abortion industry lies. They lie constantly. So the damage done to the mother 
uh, is very real. And what I'm saying is that the damage done to her by chemical abortion has a whole set of new layers of woundedness and pain and grief. You know, a person who's had an abortion has a very, very uh, negative feeling and uh, anger uh, at the abortion facility and at the abortionist. And now, with these chemical abortions more and more becoming common, uh, that anger now is going to be more directed to herself. The triggering memories are going to be connected with her own home, her bedroom, her bathroom. It, 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 it's, it's doing even more harm. Uh, to those who undergo these uh, procedures. The father is a key person in all of this, and the role of, of men in abortion is one that people are also paying more and more attention to. Uh, the character that plays uh, Abby's uh, husband, uh, Doug, is, uh, does a very good job uh, in this particular film, is very uh, supportive of her, and you know, the, the, um, he also at various times is echoing the conscience uh, of the, the, the viewer uh, and of so many people in talking to her about the work that she's doing in that abortion facility. The role of men in abortion is very big and it's very real. So often abortions happen because uh, the mom doesn't feel the support of the father. And so often the fathers make the mistake of saying to the mother, oh, well, this is your choice, it's your decision. And meanwhile, that doesn't help her. That makes her just feel more isolated. But then the grandparents. I want you to think for a moment about grandparents because they feature uh, in some of the scenes of this uh, movie pretty prominently and remind us that there's a whole other group of people who are grieving and suffering. And you can learn about this, by the way, in the book Shock Waves by Janet Morana, our executive director who co-founded Silent No More. And Silent No More has the Shockwaves initiative where we talk about the damage on grandparents. Janet herself is a, is a grandpa grandparent of an aborted baby. Uh, we talk about the impact on all the other uh, family members as well. And the book Shockwaves is uh, very uh, key in understanding a lot of the scenes in this movie. So um, go to uh, abortionshockwaves.com to learn more about all this. But one of the groups of people we focus on in talking about the shockwaves are the grandparents. So many times, if you pray in front of abortion facilities, you will see parents dragging uh, their daughters in there, literally dragging them to get an abortion that they don't want. Uh, and in this movie, there is a... Um, uh, a scene of a father bringing his daughter into the facility uh, to get uh, uh, to get the abortion, and it is such an irony because the father then is saying to Abby, "Thank you, thank you so much, thanks for all you've done. I'll always remember it." And uh, yeah, he'll always remember it, but not in the way he thinks. So the grandparents who cooperate in or even force the abortion of uh, 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 on their daughters are setting themselves up for a lifetime of regret and pain and some of you who are watching may be or may know such people and healing is available healing is necessary for you as well many grandparents are going to be uh, brought face to face with their guilt and with their pain as a result of seeing this movie the other side of the coin are the grandparents who try to stop the abortion of their grandchild. And there is a very moving scene, and in fact, it impacted uh, Abby quite a bit, where you have uh, 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 a client coming in to the facility to get her abortion. And meanwhile, her mom is there, outside on the other side of the fence, begging and pleading and crying, asking her to stop. Don't go in there to do that abortion and with that mom are other children of this mother and then you get to to start thinking about the siblings too of the um, of the uh, uh, the siblings of the aborted children they suffer as well you see uh, this scene bringing home the reality of the siblings of the aborted children and what does it say to them when they realize at some point in their life that mom had their brother, their sister killed? 
That has a profound psychological impact. Again, in this book, Deeply Damaged, by psychiatrist Philip Ney, with whom we work closely and have worked closely for decades on all these questions. He goes into, in depth, the impact abortion has on the surviving siblings. We need to be ready, as a result of many people seeing this movie, to also minister to those siblings because they will see themselves in that scene of the, uh, uh, of the mother pleading with her daughter not to abort uh, that child. Then we also have, my friends, the impact that abortion has on the pro-life people. And that's a whole other dimension of this movie because besides ripping the veil off of what abortion is, besides ripping the veil off of what abortion does to the mom and the dad, the grandparents, the siblings, besides ripping the veil off of what abortion does to the clinic workers themselves and what could shake them out of that and let them leave, you also see the dimension of the pro-life people fighting against abortion. You see the people praying, counseling out in front of this abortion facility, of course, uh, with the movement of 40 Days for Life, which again, uh, I've been involved in from the very beginning and was privileged to help launch on a national level. Uh, but 40 Days uh, is one of many different outreaches to abortion facilities and projects people can get involved in and by which they go and pray peacefully out in front of these places, reach out to uh, the uh, f folks going in uh, to get these abortions, and be a witness to the wider community. You notice in this movie two different types of uh, presence. Uh, you have the, it's, very, it's brought out very nicely that the presence of the pro-life people is not to be there in condemnation. There are gentle conversations that are happening, smiling faces, loving offers of help. Uh, and this represents the heart of the pro-life movement and uh, the people who go out for the 40 days prayer vigils manifest this. I've prayed at almost every abortion facility in the country and I've seen uh, that loving, peaceful spirit on the faces of so many of you uh, who have invited me to come to your communities and uh, so many others as well. Uh, there is a scene where you have an angry uh, man yelling and, 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 and uh, talking uh, to those going in in a, in a very, very harsh way. And you know, that's a reality too of uh, what happens in various places. But we have to understand, anger at the killing of children is a natural, normal human reaction. Uh, you know, let's not be too quick to condemn anger because if you're not angry over what is happening of, uh, uh, about the massive slaughter of babies, you're not really in touch with the reality of what's happening. And the challenge is that we have to, and I think it's a challenge that the, the movie is, is, is purposely raising for us without talking about it at any length, but it raises for us by showing the contrast uh, the challenge of taking our anger. So the, 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 point, the, the goal here should not be to snuff out the anger or not to feel the anger anymore because then you're, not, then you're dehumanizing yourself the same way that the abortion practitioners dehumanize themselves. No, the goal for us is to very much feel the anger, to let our hearts be broken, to let that inner voice of protest that we were talking about in our previous commentary truly arise and be felt, but then to channel that anger, which is a form of energy, channel that energy into productive, good work to save lives and end abortion, work that can is then submitted to the guidance and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's the way to do it. That's the way to do it. To say, Lord, I feel anger right now. What do you want me to do? Help me to know, Lord God, that this person going in to get the abortion and the people inside there doing the abortions, help me to understand, they are not the enemy. They are captive to the enemy. The real enemy is the evil itself, Satan who is behind it. The real enemy is, is, is the deceiver, the father of lies. Lord God, all of these other people, these people are my brothers and sisters. Let me approach them with compassion and let me do something. Let me do something positive and strong and getting involved in efforts 
that bring you to the abortion facility in prayer and in outreach are among the many good things that you can do and the many good ways that you can direct that energy. We see the grief on the faces, in the expressions, in the hearts of the pro-life people. And uh, as we watch this movie unplanned, we see that these pro-life people suffer. And we all suffer. We who are all involved in this great movement are bearing the pain of abortion. We ourselves may not have had any personal uh, involvement in abortion whatsoever. And yet, as pro-life people, every abortion hurts us because we're trying to save all these babies. And what happens? Most of them we do not save. And so we've got to face that. And I think this movie will also help us to face that too. Because you see the people praying out there. They're trying to persuade the, the moms that are going in not to have their abortions. And they go in anyway. Now, a lot of times we do save them we do convince them, we do turn them around, and you see an example of turnarounds in this, in this film. But most of the time, they go in, they have the procedure anyway. And my friends, we have to realize that has an impact on us. And so we too have to grieve, just like the, the mom who has the abortion, the dad who goes along with it, the grandparent who, who, who brings uh, his or her daughter in there to have the procedure, just like they have to grieve as part of their healing once they repent, we, the pro-life people, have to grieve too. The babies we couldn't save. And this is part of the, what we call the shock waves of abortion. Again, abortionshockwaves.com is a key place to go to learn more about this multifaceted wound of abortion. And Janet Morana's book called Shockwaves is a key book to read to understand all of these dynamics. The grief and the pain in the hearts of the pro-lifers, grief and pain which we submit to the Lord under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and surround in prayer, is brought out in a particularly powerful scene where the medical waste company arrives at the abortion facility to take away the bodies of the babies. And the man comes out of there with a, you know, rolling on a car, a big bin, which is filled with the, the bodies of the aborted babies. And the pro-life people are praying there on the other side of the fence, and they ask the man to please stop, bring the, 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 the garbage container over to them so that they can pray over the bodies of those babies. And he's reluctant at first, but they prevail upon him to do that. And then he says, well, wait, because I have a second one in there to, to, to come out. And he goes in and he gets a second one and he brings it out. And then the pro-life people in the movie do what I have actually done myself in various parts of the country. Right there at the abortion facility, as the medical waste man is putting the bodies of the babies, uh, taking the bodies of the babies from the abortion clinic into the, into the disposal truck, say a prayer of blessing commending those children to the Lord. I have done that standing, I did that standing in front of an open truck one time while the guy was inside getting the rest of the bodies. The truck was open and I, and I said a prayer of blessing over all the bodies that were in it. He was going from one abortion facility to another to pick up these bodies. Now that scene brings out a lot of things. First of all, it brings out, again, the grief of, of us in the pro-life effort who could not save those babies. Those babies could have been babies that we, we might have saved, but obviously didn't. And so they got torn apart by the abortionists' uh, 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 forceps and thrown, literally thrown, in the garbage. We have to commend that those bodies are sacred. Those are the bodies of human persons. We have to commend them to the Lord. We have to say a prayer of blessing over them. And they, in that scene, a beautiful prayer of blessing is said, very similar to the prayers we say all across the country when we do this. It also brings to mind, and it will bring face to face in the minds and hearts of many who have had abortions, a very common question that arises in the process of healing after abortion, and that is, what happened to my baby? 
Now the question, what happened to my baby, is asked on two levels. One is in the spiritual realm, well, where is my baby now? Is my baby in heaven? And of course, what we say and what the church says is, God loves your baby more than you do. He's a God of salvation. He wants everybody to be with Him in heaven. And so we can trustfully commend those children to the Lord. Have trust. Do not fear. The Lord loves them. The Lord takes care of them in His own way. We don't know the details of exactly how He does that. We know that He wants everyone to be baptized in order to be saved. We don't know how He handles the situations of those that don't have a chance for baptism, except we know that He's a God of infinite mercy. So we commend without, without anxiety, without fear, we commend our children to the hands of a God who loves them even more than we do. And then, of course, the question, what happened to my baby, also is asked on a physical level. What did they do with the bodies? What did they do with them? And as we see in this movie, what many of the abortion facilities do is that they hire a company to come and pick up the bodies, take them away. Now, sometimes, depending on the circumstances, the bodies of aborted babies will be taken to pathology labs where they will be evaluated, perhaps to reveal some genetic problem with the mother and so forth. Other times, these companies are just taking them away as disposal, waste disposal. Other times, the abortion facilities just throw them in the dumpster, although more and more of them try to avoid doing that because we pro-life people find those bodies, sometimes by accident, sometimes on purpose, so that we can give them a proper burial. In fact, sometimes they're found by accident in garbage bins that have been left elsewhere, like the incident in California in the 1980s where a gigantic uh, uh, disposal bin containing the bodies of 16,500 babies was discovered, and a legal battle ensued for several years, and finally they were, uh, over whether they could be buried. Pro-abortion people don't even want to give these babies the, the recognition of a burial, but finally those babies were buried, uh, buried in, a, in a cemetery in Los Angeles called the Odd Fellows Cemetery. I've prayed there a number of times at that grave site of 16,500 aborted babies. Other times, uh, babies have been found in the, on the hillsides, literally. Been found by children in dumpsters, the story out of Milwaukee years ago, and the police saw children throwing things off the bridge and went and said, what are you doing? What are you throwing? And they said, little people. And they literally had these containers with the aborted babies in them. The children found them on the streets. Our streets are flowing, literally, with the blood of the innocent babies. This has got to stop. And we've got to wake up about it. These abortion clinics don't, don't care about what happens to these babies. They treat their bodies with the same disrespect that they treated them when they, when they killed them. And brothers and sisters, we in the pro-life movement sometimes have the opportunity to bury these babies. I'd mentioned about pathologists a moment ago. Well, another way that the, that the abortion facilities, by the way, just to finish talking about what they do with the bodies, some of them grind them up in uh, basically uh, meat grinders, flush them down the sewer, flush them down the toilet. The, the, the trial of Kermit Gosnell, I was in the courtroom when one of the workers there testified as to how the baby parts were coming back, backing up and coming back up the drain. They just flush them down the sewage. Other times abortion facilities literally incinerate them. To remind you about another sad phase of our history when human bodies were incinerated? Abortionist George Tiller had in his clinic in Wichita the incineration machines. And one of the people that I helped after she came out of the abortion industry who worked with George Tiller testified, yeah, I would go into my office, he would fire up the machines, I'd be down the hallway and I could smell the babies burning. Laura Tivis who worked for George Tiller. That's what she said. I remember talking to her about it a number of times. I could smell the babies burning. 
an incinerator. So this scene in the movie brings up a very important part of this whole story, a part that not enough people think about. You know, there's a case knocking at the door right now of the U.S. Supreme Court over an Indiana law regarding the proper disposal of the bodies of these babies. Because that's something now it's coming up in various state laws now uh, where pro-life pro-life groups are trying to say, well, at least let's recognize the dignity of these bodies by giving them proper uh, burial. And the pro-abortion people are opposing those laws. Now, we'll see if the Supreme Court ends up taking this particular case. But out of Indiana and in a number of other states as well, these fetal disposal laws have come up and they, and they, and they have a very good purpose. Because if we be, can begin by at least recognizing that these are human remains and they're to be treated with dignity, then we're one step closer to recognizing that the babies are human and should be treated with dignity. And ultimately that means they should not be killed. But we sometimes have the opportunity to bury them. And there have been times when I mentioned earlier the pathologists. Uh, I had a situation where a pathologist who had received the bodies of some aborted babies after having done the examination that he was supposed to do, didn't want to just throw them away. He had enough of a conscience to realize these babies ought to be buried. He contacted another pastor, met the pastor at night in the street under a lamp post, and gave him the bodies. And then that pastor contacted me, and we arranged for burial. If they don't sell the body parts, and that's another thing that these abortion clinics do, and I was involved with Life Dynamics back in the late 1990s, exposing the sale of baby body parts. That's not something that just was revealed a few years ago when David Delighton also came to me and to some other pro-life leaders and said, hey, I've got some big information about Planned Parenthood. And uh, those videos came to light of showing the sale of body parts. We had the order forms. We had the order forms back from the late 90s showing, uh, give me eyes, uh, I want to purchase some livers, heart, brain, legs, arms. University research labs buying the body parts from the abortion facility. Mark Crutcher of Life Dynamics exposed uh, this. It's going on. It's been going on. It continues to go on. Planned Parenthood and other abortion facilities are breaking the law as they do this, but that's what happens to some of the body parts too. But as I say, if they don't get sold, if they don't get incinerated, if they don't get flushed down the sewer or thrown in garbage bins, sometimes they get buried. And we started uh, the uh, National Day of Remembrance, the second Saturday of September. As some of you participate in, in your own local communities, we have about 50 places around the United States where aborted babies are buried. Some, like the Odd Fellows Cemetery in Los Angeles that I mentioned, have tens of thousands of bodies in them. There's a grave in, the, in a Dallas uh, cemetery that has about 900 bodies. In Chicago, there's a grave that has about 2,000 bodies. Um, in Holy Apostles Seminary, uh, there's a, an aborted baby buried at Steubenville Franciscan University. There are three aborted babies buried there. Uh, we have these, these, um, these bodies, these burial places uh, in various parts of the country. And on the National Day of Remembrance, the second Saturday of September, we urge people to come together and have memorial services uh, at these places. And, uh, and, and not just on that day, but all throughout the year. We need to go to these places. We need to visit. We need to stand at these graves. We need to come in contact with the humanity of these babies, and not just at their graves. But let me say something here very strong and very clear. At their funerals and at their wakes, I'll always be grateful to, to the sisters there at Mother Angelica's shrine. I've talked with, talked with Mother Angelica about this many times over the years that I... I, I knew her and interacted with her at EWTN. But the sisters permitted us to do a big funeral in 2008, right there at the big shrine in Hansville. Now, I know that many of you have visited or, or plan to visit at some point that shrine that Mother Angelica built in Hansville, Alabama. 
When you go in, you go along a road, there's a white picket fence. Just before you enter the main area for the shrine, there is a statue of the Pieta on the left side of the road. Go there, and right at the base of the Pieta statue, you will see uh, headstones there with the names of the aborted and miscarried babies who are buried right there. In, inside the shrine, there's also another spot where there's an aborted baby buried. I was involved in those burials. But we did a big funeral for these aborted babies, and our friend Monica Miller from uh, Michigan, uh, Citizens for a Pro-Life Society, I did a number of these funerals with her up in Michigan as well. Um, and uh, she brought these babies down. She's one of the people who has found many of these babies in trash dumpsters all across the country. And we work together. But the idea is not just to give the babies the burial, which they deserve. The idea is to show people what's going on. And I have a, a, a DVD uh, of this funeral that we did at EWT. And we're going to make, in fact, one of these programs that we do with you, my friends, here on Facebook and other platforms, uh, we're going to show that, that, that entire funeral. I think you'll, you'll really be moved uh, as you see it. But I said in the sermon there, they were killed in darkness. Now they need to be honored in the bright light of day. We cannot cooperate with Planned Parenthood in hiding the reality of abortion. One of the things that needs to be done to bring people face to face with the humanity of these children and the reality of the violence that killed them is that we, let, we need to let people see them. I can't tell you how many times various memorial services around the country, uh, we've had open casket wakes to let people see the bodies of these babies. Let me say it as clearly as possible. It is absolutely essential that we see the bodies, the mangled bodies, the scarred and bruised bodies, the decapitated and dismembered bodies of the babies who have been aborted. America will not reject abortion until America sees abortion. And we in the pro-life movement, and I personally, are committed to show you these babies. We have done it before. We will do it again. We will do it from coast to coast, from north to south, from east to west, from northwest to southeast, and northeast to southwest. We must blanket this country and this world with the reality of what so many people in their ignorance, in their pride, and in their sinfulness, in their denial, in their rationalization, in being trapped in the abortion industry like Abby Johnson was, are allowing to happen. We must expose it. We must show it. We must see it. Because what this movie unplanned, what this book unplanned demonstrates is that when the reality of these babies and the bodies of these babies are made visible, not invisible, not hidden, not covered over, but shown in the bright light of day, my friends, the conscience is awakened. And that's what we're in the business of doing, is it not? Awaken consciences, changing minds and hearts, being prophetic, doing what St. Paul says to the Ephesians, have nothing to do with the fruitless works of darkness, but rather, what does he say? Those of you that know the scriptures, those of you that dress like I dress and preach in the pulpit, what does he say? Expose them. Have nothing to do with the fruitless works of darkness, but rather expose them. That's the Word of God. That's the Word of God, and we're going to obey it. This movie exposes them, those works of darkness, the killing of these children, the disposal of their bodies, the lies told to the moms and the dads and the grandparents, the persecution of the pro-life people, the damage done, deeply damaged, as Dr. Ney says. You know, we've been working in exposing, one of the reasons I'm so excited about this movie, we've been working in exposing the abortion industry for decades. 
this book, Lime 5. I also want to send you this book. You need to read all these books, my friends. I, mean, I know some of, so, so many of you are so committed to this cause. As part of getting deeply rooted in this cause, I need you to read these books. Lime 5, I helped put this book together back in the mid-90s, together with our friend Mark Crutcher from Life Dynamics. It is a catalog, a sad, disturbing catalog of the various abuses of the abortion industry. And when we talk about abuses, you know, we're all rightly disturbed by the clergy sex abuse scandal. But look at what happens in the abortion industry as well. Vulnerable patients going in there for an abortion and being sexually abused by the abortionist. We've got documentation of that right here. We've got documentation here of the falsification of medical records, of tax evasion, of substance abuse and, and, and various self-destructive behaviors of the abortionists. All kinds of things. Malpractice galore. Like I always say, and again, it's one of the things I'm off, uh, most often quoted as saying, you can't practice vice virtuously. If your conscience is so twisted and darkened that you can kill a baby, you're going to be doing a lot of other wicked things as well. And therefore we see the, the tax evasion, the malpractice, the lying, the sexual abuse. This book, Line 5, we'll, we'll send it to you. And then I want to just point out two other books, because again, this movie Unplanned, we have, to, we have to realize what's being done here. The abortion industry and the damage abortion does is being exposed. It's not just about one person leaving the abortion industry. It's about what does the abortion industry do to our society. Forbidden Grief, our own pastoral associate here at Priests for Life, doctor, psychologist, Teresa Burke, wrote this book years ago. She co-founded Rachel's Vineyard. She founded Rachel's Vineyard. And she and her husband are both full-time associates on our Priests for Life team. They oversee, and we help them to oversee, the world's largest ministry for healing after abortion called Rachel's Vineyard. And this is a book that, unlike any other, is going to help you really understand the damage that abortion does. Notice it's called Forbidden Grief, because the grief of those that have aborted their, their children in a society that says this is a right, in a society where in major cities buildings are lit up as the right to abort these babies later and later in pregnancy is granted under the law, make it, the people who are grieving over abortion feel silly for feeling sad. And in the sense, therefore, their grief is forbidden by a pro-choice culture. And what we do and what movies like Unplanned do is to say to those who have that grief, no, it's no longer forbidden. It makes sense to feel sad over the killing of your child. It makes sense to cry and to grieve and to feel terrible about yourself. But take our hands because we're not going to let you stay in that despair. We're going to lift you up with new hope. Let me show you one more book. The Detrimental Effects of Abortion. You know what this is? A bibliography. Now you know what a bibliography is. You know, maybe you write a paper and in the back you have to put your bibliography, list the sources uh, that you cited or that other maybe additional reading for the topic about which you just wrote. In a book you have a bibliography at the back. It might be several pages. This entire book is a bibliography. Just listing the studies that have been done on the damaging effects of abortion, and these are by no means all the studies. This is just to give you an idea. There are other books like this as well. Just to give you an idea. Eating disorders, uh, depressive reactions, uh, infertility, infection, psychological effects. Uh, one after another, there's like... There's like six, seven, eight studies on each page of this couple of hundred pages uh, of, uh, of text. Don't let anybody ever tell you 
abortion is a benefit for women or part of health care. Don't let them even say it. So, there is hope and there is healing. As the movie Unplanned is shown, more and more people are seeing the screenings of it during these days, but it will be shown in the, in the theater starting on the 29th. And how far it will go after that all depends on the success in the theaters that weekend. That's how this business works. But brothers and sisters, go see it. But keep in mind all the things I've told you in this program and the previous program because the message is to everybody, there's hope. If you've had an abortion, if you're a father or a mother, if you're a friend who brought someone to get an abortion, if you're a grandparent, if you're a sibling, if you're a pro-life activist, if you're an abortionist and you feel that conflict and you feel that tug of conscience and you feel like you want to get out of the killing business, there's hope. There's healing. We are here for you. Let me give you a couple of resources, finally, to lead people to that healing. As I said, I oversee the largest ministry in the world for healing after abortion. Go to rachelsvineyard.org to learn about it. Not just for the moms, for the dads, for the family members, former clinic workers, uh, rachelsvineyard.org. Now, there are many other healing programs along with um, Rachel's Vineyard. And you can get a clearinghouse of these programs and where the nearest one is to you by going to abortionforgiveness.com. And at abortionforgiveness.com, you can enter in your zip code and you'll find not only the Rachel's Vineyard retreats, but also the um, other uh, healing ministries that might be operating near you including in the pregnancy centers that have uh, programs for healing after abortion. Again, abortionforgiveness.com. And finally, anyone who is currently working in an abortion facility or used to work in an abortion facility, like Abby did, can find help from us at the societyofcenturions.com. This is the original medical model that Dr. Philip Ney began. This is where, when Abby first came to me, when she left the abortion facility, we utilized this model of the centurions. We did various retreats together for centurions. And I had been doing them, as I say, from the 1990s. And Dr. Philip Ney is the founder of this. Janet Morana has been trained in this, as well as other clergy that we work with. Societyofcenturions.com is a place where you can go. People can sign up, get more information, and learn about what is available for healing. And many other resources as well. And we will be uh, putting all of these things out uh, in our emails, on our websites, and in these programs as the days go on. So thank you, friends, for being a bridge for people to that healing and to a deeper awareness of what abortion is and how it hurts us all. Let's pray. Father, thank you for life and for the privilege of defending life. Bless your people. Open their eyes and minds and hearts to the reality of abortion. Help us to expose its evil and help all people, Lord, to make the journey of the centurion who, having participated in the death of Jesus on the cross, repented and said, surely this was an innocent man. May our society repent of killing the children in the womb and wake up and say, surely these were innocent lives and we are sorry. And may we, the people of life, be able to say to them that they no longer have to be crouched in a dark corner, absorbed in the shame and guilt of their sin, but rather that there is one who stands over them. There is a light that shines into that darkness. There is a Savior, and He says to them, Arise, stand up, lift up your head with new hope and new life, for I have redeemed you. May the Lord Jesus Christ be revealed to these people, and lead them to the fullness of hope and life. We pray through the same Christ our Lord. Amen.
My final point, friends, so many of those who have found that healing are silent no more. And that's our campaign for letting these people be a voice, be a witness, be a testimony to the rest of the world that, yes, there is a Savior. Yes, there is healing. Go to silentnomore.com to learn more about that. Well, I've given you lots of information. Watch this video again. Take notes. Share it with others. Let's get the word out. I rely on you to help us to do that. Now may the Lord bless you and protect you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great day, friends. Father Frank Pavone here of Priests for Life. Abby Johnson is in the other room. Here. Our first order of business is to present Planned Parenthood's Employee of the Year Award. Abby Johnson. This is Abby. She's our newest volunteer escort. Abby, this is Cheryl Alessandro. I'd be the youngest director in Planned Parenthood history. You'll actually be in charge of the abortions at your clinic. I have a chance to make a real difference. No matter what you do for the rest of your life, you're still going to be a baby killer. The only thing that's changed is you, Abby. Can you even hear yourself talk right now about these procedures? These are little babies. I'm not going to apologize for doing a job that helps women in crisis. There's still a part of me that isn't sure. I know. But the one thing that all experts agree on is that at this stage, the fetus can't feel anything. Sorry to bother you, but they need an extra person in the back room. Are you free? I saw it. It was like it was twisting and fighting for its life. We commend the souls of these hundreds of children. And Lord, we pray to end abortion. I really appreciate what you've done for us. I'll not forget it. 22,000 abortions. How do I even comprehend that? Rough day at the office. You can say that. You're making a mess. <laughs> what are you doing? It's your dad and me. You are our baby from the moment of conception. We are paying you to be a perfect instrument of corporate policy. We are an abortion provider. I can't be a part of this anymore. Everything that they told us is a lie. Don't underestimate the repercussions of this. You gotta be careful. Rhonda, please don't do this! Rhonda! Let me tell you what's gonna happen if you walk through that door. Congratulations, you've made an enemy of one of the most powerful organizations on the planet. But you know what? When you and I take up this call and we talk about abortion, if we speak about it in church, we're told we're too political. If we speak about it in the political arena, we're told we're too religious. If we speak about it in the world of the media, it's too disturbing. In the world of business, it's too distracting. In the world of education, it's too controversial. In the streets, it's too disruptive. So abortion, if abortion is wrong, where do we go to say so? We go into the churches, we go into politics, into the media, into business, into education, and into the streets. Some churches, some churches haven't wanted, got, wanted to get involved in political hassles with the government, so they've been silent on abortion. They didn't want to get involved in hassles from the government. They didn't want to take the fight to the government. So now with the HHS mandate, the government took the fight to them. And when it comes to that mandate, we've got a simple message. We will obey God rather than men. As Alveda can tell us, her uncle said one day to the civil rights movement, we've got a lot of obstacles in our way, but we're not going to let anything turn us around. We're not going to let no dogs turn us around, no water hoses turn us around, no police clubs or jail sentences, and we're not going to let any injunctions turn us around. And so today I say to you, in the pro-life movement, no Planned Parenthood is going to turn us around. No biased media is going to turn us around. No HHS mandate is going to turn us around. No Obama.